is Bonnie Vandermulen, Training Coordinator for Wisconsin Facets. On behalf of our entire Wisconsin Facets staff, I'd like to thank you for joining us today. Today's webinar is entitled Child, Child Outcomes, What Families Need to Know and How to Take a More Active Role in the Process. Our presenters today are three of them in number. One is Michelle Ogorek. Michelle is the statewide early childhood consultant. Her role supports providing quality, inclusive services for preschoolers with IEPs. Nancy Furman has worked on the special education team at the Department of Public Instruction for 31 years. In her role with the team, she focuses on data collection and reporting. Also today with us is Stephanie Lulish. Um, she is a parent of a child with a disability. Stephanie is the Family Engagement Coordinator at CISA 12 and th through the Wisconsin Parent Educator Initiative Grant. Um, for today, I'd like to thank all of you for joining us, and I'd like to have all three of our presenters available at this time. So Nancy, Stephanie, and Michelle, thank you. So hello all and welcome. I am Nancy Furman with the Department of Public Instruction and I'm going to be kicking us off today. So we're going to spend some time talking about child outcomes. And we'll begin talking about why we collect child outcomes data or information. Then we'll talk about what are the child outcomes and how the information is collected. And then we'll move into talking about how the child outcomes information is used by your child's school and how you and your family can use the information and be more involved in the collection of the information. So child outcomes, this is the why. And the why is, why we collect child outcomes is it's, it's a requirement. So each year, the Department of Public Instruction is required to submit an annual performance report, otherwise sometimes shortened to an APR, to the Office of Special Education Programs within the US Department of Education. And the APR addresses the state's progress in meeting annual targets that have been set for 17 specific indicators one of which is um, child outcomes for preschool age children. And kind of the purpose of the APR or of these indicators, it's really to um, improve educational results and functional outcomes of students with disabilities, while at the same time ensuring the requirements of the Individuals with Disabilities Act, Education Act or IDEA, that those requirements are being met. So if you were to look at the APR as a whole, you would see that some of the indicators are compliance related, some of them are performance or results, and the child outcomes is one of those performance or results indicators. So the child outcomes indicator itself is a measure of child progress during the time a child is receiving early childhood special education services. And the information collected is then used to determine whether early childhood special education programs are making a positive difference in the lives of young children and their families. So because child outcomes are a requirement, and it's a requirement of all states, um, and it's for all children ages three through five, there really isn't an, an opt out. That was kind of the why. So at a high level, it's a requirement, but it really goes so much more beyond just being a requirement. And we'll talk more about that as we um, continue with our presentation. So now we're gonna kind of talk about what. What are the child outcomes? Well, the child outcomes focus on three areas of child functioning necessary for each child to be an active and su successful participant at home, in early care and education settings, and in the community. And specifically, the three child outcome areas focus on three areas. And you can see those on the screen. So it's positive social emotional skills, which sometimes we shorten to relationships. It's acquisition and use of knowledge and skills, which we kind of shorten to learning. And that's the use of appropriate behaviors to meet needs. We kind of shorten that to independence. So relationships, learning, and independence. And then in upcoming slides, we'll go into more details kind of regarding um, skills that are kind of associated with each of these outcome areas. Now we're gonna talk about the, the how we collect the data. And that's the rating process. And really it boils down to an entry rating and an exit rating. So when your child begins receiving early childhood special education services, your child's functioning for each of those three outcome areas will be compared to age expected functioning. And so if your child begins receiving special education services at age three, for example, 
your child's functioning in each of those outcome areas will be compared to what is expected for a three-year-old. Your child's functioning then for each outcome area is rated using a seven-point rating scale that measures how close your child's functioning is to age-expected functioning. And so the information that they use when they're kind of determining this rating is gathered from a variety of sources. So they use an age, and age anchoring assessment tool, but they also rely on observations of your child in different settings and interviews or conversations with those individuals providing care to your child. So that, of course, would include you. When your child exits early childhood special education services, your child's functioning again in each of those three outcome areas is going to be compared to what is age expected. An exit for child outcomes purposes is at the end of the school year prior to your child entering kindergarten. So if you have a child who's in 4K this year, districts are probably starting to think now about doing the exit rating for your child. So basically the progress that a child makes in reaching age expected functioning for the outcome area is what is being measured by comparing a child's exit rating to their child's entry rating. And when the state, so when the Department of Public Instruction does its annual performance report or its APR, it's gathering data across all districts in the state and it's just summarizing that data. So it's summarizing the measurement of progress. We don't ever report anything in the APR about an individual child. So we talked about, again, the why is that it's a requirement, but again, it goes beyond being just a requirement. So by examining the progress children make in each of these outcome areas, the district is able to kind of measure the effectiveness of its early childhood programs, so it can kind of see, you know, how much progress are children making? So what is the um, gains that they're making towards reaching that age expected functioning? Districts then can look deeper into those outcome areas and they can kind of identify like program strengths and weaknesses, and they can kind of think in terms of how they can improve their services and their delivery. And through all of this, then it leads to improved planning and implementation of curriculum, assessments, and then of course, developing IEPs. So then we get to the part about why is this information important to me and my family? Well, the three outcome areas, they focus on what your child can do in everyday routines and activities. So by looking at how well your child is doing in each of the three outcome areas, you can determine what your child may need to be more involved in your family's activities. At the same time, as a parent, as you learn more about these three child outcome areas, so again, the relationships, the learning, and the independence, you're going to gain confidence in your ability to observe your child and share those observations with those who interact with your child, like with your child care providers or with your child's teachers. You're also going to be able to um, develop an increased understanding of how your child is functioning compared to what is age expected. And you're going to be able then to track and celebrate the progress your child is making. And at the same time, then, you're going to be able to share more with your child's IEP team about your child's strengths, weaknesses, accomplishments, which then should lead to the development of better and more appropriate IEP goals for your child. And of course, also by you providing information to your school district in this whole child outcomes process, the district then is able, better able to actually look at its early childhood program overall to see how well it's, it's doing. So Nancy kind of just provided us an overview of child outcomes. That was the, the mile high view. As your child enters early childhood and receives services, you are going to be asked to provide information on your child's development around these three outcome areas. So now let's dig a little deeper into each of the actual three outcome areas. We'll talk about what skills and behaviors are included in each of the areas. We'll also talk about and explore a set of questions that you might want to use as a tool to increase your understanding and your engagement in this process. So let's get started with our first outcome area, and that is positive social skills, or as Nancy had said, relationships. So positive social emotional skills, it refers to how your child gets along with and relates to other children and adults. This outcome includes ways that your child expresses emotions and feelings, um, how he or she interacts with and plays with other children, and how your child follows rules. 
social roles, things like interacting with others, um, playing games, and turn-taking. So I want to take a moment, and I want you to think about your child. So just take a moment and think about your child, and we're going to talk about some of their development. I'm going to ask you a few questions to help you get a better idea of what's actually included in this outcome area. And as I ask the questions, I just want you to think about what your responses would be with relation to your child's development. We will show you at the end of the webinar, you'll have access to all these questions. So I'm gonna ask you a few questions and I want you just to think about your response for your child. First, how does your child relate to family members? How do they relate to caregivers? How do they even relate to strangers? How does your child relate to other children? maybe in childcare, maybe in the neighborhood? How do they re relate to people in the community? Maybe when you're at the grocery store or at a park? How does your child show his or her feelings? How does your child calm down when they're upset? How does your child show that he or she understands social rules, like sharing and turn-taking? This type of information that teachers, providers, and other specialists that work with your child will be asking you and gathering for the child outcome process. So we'd like you to know more about the three outcome areas so that you can take a more active role. Let's take a look at outcome area two. The second outcome area is acquisition and use of knowledge and skills. So this refers to your child's ability to think, reason, remember, problem solve. This outcome area also includes early learning concepts. And what I mean by early learning concepts, it might be symbols, pictures, numbers. There may be some classification, even spatial relationships. So some of those very basic concepts. The acquisition of language and communication, early literacy skills and numeracy skills are also included in this outcome area. So this particular outcome area is kind of thought of as the precursor of what is needed so children will experience success later in elementary school when they're taught those academic subjects, like reading and math. Again, I want you to think about your child. We're going to go through the que some different questions. I want you to think about your child, and I'm going to um, ask you the questions so that you can kind of frame what acquisition and use of knowledge and skills include. Okay. How does your child child try to solve problems? How does your child use words? Does your child understand and respond to directions from others and also you? How does your child communicate his or her thoughts and ideas? These are the questions that relate to outcome area two. Now we're going to take a look at the final outcome area, which is use of appropriate behaviors to meet their needs, or as Nancy has said, relating to independence. This is the final outcome area. The use of appropriate behaviors to meet needs refers to the actions that your child's going to um, employ to take care of their basic needs. And what I mean by that is maybe getting from place to place, using tools like a fork, a toothbrush, um, a hairbrush, and in older children, maybe even contributing to their own health and safety. The outcome includes how children take care of themselves, such as dressing, feeding, hairbrushing, toileting, toothbrushing, um, how they carry out responsibilities at home, so household responsibilities, and how they act on the world to get what they want. So really, in short, we're looking at your child's increasing capacity to become independent and interacting with the world and taking care of their needs. Again, I'm going to ask you a few set of questions. And again, these questions will be, you'll have access to them at the end of the webinar. First, how does your child get from place to place? Here we're looking at your child's um, motor abilities. How does your, what, what does your child do when he or she wants something? What does your child do when he or she needs help? How does your child help with dressing and undressing, using the bathroom, brushing their teeth, um, eating type activities? What does your child do without your help? So most of the questions here are really looking at some of those basic self-help skills, and they're also looking at some of those early motor skills, and they're also looking at independent skills. So we've put all these questions in a handout that you might wanna use during the child outcome process. You could use the document as a way of gathering your thoughts. You might want to actually write out the answers, or you just might want to use it to spark thoughts about your child's development. 
you may want to actually also share this information with your child's service provider to talk about your child's development. It's a nice tool to get your, get your mind thinking about the three outcome areas um, so that you can have more active engagement. So when we take a child's positive social relationships plus acquiring and using knowledge and skills plus taking actions to meet needs, we have all the information needed to paint a picture of the whole child and their total development. Because we wanna make sure that we don't always look at individual isolated skills or areas of um, development. We wanna be able to have a whole complete idea of your child from um, a more functional perspective. So in short, Child Outcomes focuses on skills and abilities that children need to be successful in everyday activities and routines, and skills that children need to be successful in future school settings. So we talked about the three outcome areas. Now let's take a deeper look at how those areas are actually measured. So when Nancy was giving us the overview a few minutes ago, we heard that your child will be rated in these three areas. So what does that really mean? How are those ratings determined? And will you be able to be part of the process and provide information? We know that families want to know about their child's progress. Child Outcomes measures that progress by comparing your child functioning before and after receiving early childhood services in these three areas that we just talked about. Your child's functioning is gonna be compared to same age typically developing peers when they enter and when they exit early childhood service. This is a little bit different from measuring progress on IEP goals. When we measure progress on IEP goals, we are looking at your child's individual growth, not that compared to other typically developing children of the same age. But when we are looking at child outcomes, we are comparing your child's growth to that of same age, typically developing peers. And when we're referring to the IEP, we're looking at your child's growth within themselves. So outcomes, we're looking at the big picture and we do do the comparison between children, um, that are typically developing and that are the same age. When we do the IEP goals and we do that measurement, we're, we're looking at your child's individual growth within those, and that is how the development is being rated. So how is that growth actually measured and reported? So your child's progress is gonna be reported, as Nancy has said, on a one to seven point scale with seven showing age expected. Now, it's important to note that each of the seven points on the scale really does have a clearly defined specific criteria. These criteria are grounded in three categories or functional levels. First one is demonstrating skills within age expected. So your child is functioning in that particular outcome area like all other kids typically around that same age. The second category of functional levels is demonstrating skills that are below expected levels. Sometimes we call this immediate foundational. So these are, this is where your, your child isn't just, is not totally up to age expected. They are showing some delays. And the third area is where your child may be demonstrating skills which are significantly below expected levels or foundational skills. So you can kind of think of it as a, a, a staircase. The first step, um, is very foundational skin, skills. Those are skills that are very um, foundational to learning and development and are significantly delayed. The next one are immediate foundational skills. So those skills that are, are skills that are a little bit closer to age expected, but yet not at age expected. And the third um, step is kiddos that are expressing um, skills that are age expected. So teams, um, they're gonna determine what rating is the most appropriate for your child in each of the outcome areas by answering a variety of questions. So as the questions are answered, the process that we use in Wisconsin takes them down a decision tree and finally to an accurate rating. So please remember that you are providing information in this team and you can be part of this team. The information used to determine these ratings does come from multiple sources of information, so we don't make decisions just based on one individual piece of evidence. Examples of those sources may include parent input, you providing parent input. Um, it may be interview. You may be interviewed or maybe the caregiver or the child care um, provider may be interviewed. Um, 
teacher observation is another way, and then also from an assessment tool. The assessment tool will look at your child's global development and compare it to what is age expected over time. So that's where the comparison to typically developing um, children comes in. Finally, you are an essential partner in helping to measure your child's progress. You know your child best. You're the expert. You can share your observations of how your child is getting along with family and friends, how your child learns and does new things during play, and how your child is able to get what he or she wants or needs at home or even in other settings. So we all need to be working together as a team to provide your child with the very best services and get the very best information to help make decisions. So I'm hoping that you have an idea of what the process looks like. Please remember that your school district will provide you with support throughout the whole entire process. Um, they will be asking you um, questions to be able to get some information because we want to make sure that we're having that clear picture of your child across different settings and situations. So what we thought next what we would do is it might be nice to have a parent talk about their experiences. So what I'm going to do is a really short interview with Stephanie. And as Bonnie had told us, Stephanie is a parent with a child with a disability, but she also comes from a really also very unique perspective. She's a parent, she's also a family engagement coordinator, and she was an early childhood teacher. So let's get started with our interview. Hi, Stephanie. First, Hello. I want to thank you. First, I want to thank you for coming and joining us today and sharing your perspective. It's greatly appreciated. So I'm just going to start out by asking you a few questions and if you can give us your perspective. Sure. So the first one is, how, how did you actually learn about the outcome process when your child went to um, the school district? So I first learned about child outcomes when my child was transitioning to the birth three program. And at our transition planning meeting that we had prior to um, moving into um, an IEP, we met with the school and our provider from Bertha 3, and they talked about um, the steps along the way as to what would be happening. They used a tool called a Journey to Three, which is a transitional roadmap for families um, to walk us through this process. Um, if if our child was found eligible for services, they kind of laid out the roadmap of what it would look like and what they would be happening at each step along the way. Um, they explained what happens at an IEP meeting and how the school needs to learn more about my child to be able to fill out child outcomes. They talked about that process um, in the event that my, if my child was eligible. The school representative was at our meeting and suggested that we started to think about what our child was able to do and about what her development looks like across all settings that she goes into. Such as, for example, like how does our child interact with children that she's familiar with or not familiar with? Um, how does she express herself when she wants something? Or what does that look like when um, we sit down and read a story um, to her? So I like, I like the fact, um, I think if I'm recalling that you said when you sat down, they asked what your child could do. So coming from a strengths base, um, not always as to what your child can't do. So let me ask you another question. So why is the outcomes information important to your child and your family? So I think for the, you know, first off, um, I'm going to reflect back on that strength-based perspective because oftentimes when we're, our child has a disability, sometimes we're caught in that negative catalyst of what they can't do. And so it really pulls out what they can do. But as Nancy had shared before as well, these outcomes focus on what your child can do in their everyday routines and activities. And by really looking at each of those three areas, you can really determine what um, your child needs in order to become more involved in school or family activities. Um, you know, one may start to notice that you gain more confidence in your ability to observe your child in the different areas um, and be able to do and share those observations with others. And truly, you really start noticing what they can do versus what's, and what's difficult for them. Okay. so. So how did you, as, as you started going through this process and you were getting ready to kind of prepare for the discussion, um, how did you pre prepare? What did, did you, were there documents you looked at? Were there people you spoke with? How did you prepare? 
I started off just thought about how my child acted, participated, and functioned in her daily life. Um, when we were with other people, I, I, you know, I would take that observer perspective and just watch, um, watch her with other children of her own age and watch to see how those interactions went, what her behavior was like when she didn't get something that she wanted, um, how long did it take her to move past what she wanted to do if there was kind of either a tantrum happening or whatever, whatever it was, kind of looked at it in those lights of those three outcome areas um, to see. Um, just have an idea behind me of what how she's able to do. So you put on your good observation glasses to be able to start mm -hmm. thinking what's happening. I just have a couple more questions. So, um, and I think I kind of alluded to this earlier in the other one, but do you know of, did you come across any tools or anything that kind of helped you organize the information? Now I do know that we are going to provide the tool of all the questions so that parents can kind of get a better perspective as to what's included in the three outcome areas, but what did you come across in the process? Sure. Um, during the evaluation meeting, um, our school staff gave us two documents that were created by WISPI. Um, at, at home, before the meeting where we developed the IEP, I sat with my husband and we filled out these two documents according to how we viewed um, her skills, generalizing across all the settings that she is in. And, so one of them is the student snapshot um, and an all about me document. And this gave us a chance to come to the meeting prepared with having things written down, rather than trying to think on the spot about some of these things when they ask you questions about, how is your child when they relate to other children? And you kind of freeze at the moment, but when it's written down, um, you actually have a better um, way of responding. Yeah, um, we actually did put those two documents on the last slide, which is the resource slide. And if we have time, we'll we'll bring those up because those are two fabulous documents. Okay, so in the question, you mentioned something about these documents were created by WISPI. What is WISPI? Um, WISPI stands for the Wisconsin State Parent Educator Initiative. And it is a Department of Public Instruction grant. And our vision for WISPI is that all families and school communities have the belief, the knowledge, and the skills to meaningfully engage in effective decision making to improve those outcomes for students of all abilities. Our mission is to develop strong relationships and build effective partnerships. And WISPI is all about partnerships. So our goal is to help families and school districts find and create the resources that will help build positive working relationships that lead to shared decision making and better outcomes for the students. So we have a statewide phone support line that's available for families to help navigate any special education questions and concerns and to help build advocacy within families. But also there are family engagement coordinators located across the pieces across um, the state of Wisconsin. So um, Stephanie, um, when we um, are done, can you put the, um, the phone call, the phone number, we'll put that on our ending slide so that people have access to that because it's a, it's a really good um, resource. Yes. Yes. So now I'm going to transition and put on my other hat as that family engagement coordinator for WISPI um, for the um, Wisconsin State Parent Educator Initiative at CISA 12. Um, and it goes far across all the pieces where the, edu the, um, the coordinators are located. And there's a variety of coordinators across the state within our CISA boundaries. And we really encourage families to be actively involved in their child's IEP meetings. You know, one, for that you're the child's first teacher, that families, communities, and schools all have significant roles to play in this, in terms of what we provide for our children. And when we allow for experiences with our children, it allows this, our children to feel secure, to thrive um, physically, and get along with others, and learn well, and feel part, to be part of the community. Um, so it's important to really provide that information and participate. And each piece of the information that you share as a parent really paints that picture of your child's development. And support for your child can be much more effective when you share information about their strengths and their weaknesses. Parents paint that movie of development versus just a quick snapshot of a moment in time that evaluation teams often bring forward when talking about your child's skills and abilities. It's the key to appropriate services to address the child's needs. Um, parents provide critical input. 
you as a parent have the most complete understanding of your child's physical and social development and family history, and really around the needs and what they're able to do. And communication is essential. So your communication increases the, your child's success greatly. Parents taint that movie of development, as we said before, versus that snapshot of a moment in time. It's the key to appropriate services to really address the child's needs that they have. And children learn best when significant adults work together. So we need to communicate together on, um, to help your child be successful. So you as a parent are building that bridge to success. This is the opening to your child's education. As a parent, the need for you to be that co-creator of the plan for your child and with other educators starts with providing information so that appropriate services can be decided upon to best suit your child's educational needs. Stephanie, I really liked the analogy you used that um, by bringing all this, all these pieces together, we're what did you say? We're creating um, a movie rather than a snapshot. And I think that that aligns really nice when we were talking before about how these three outcome areas, we want to paint a picture of the whole entire child. So between the, the, the parents and all the information and sources, hopefully we do get that movie and that, that movie of the whole entire child. Thank you, Stephanie, for sharing with us. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the resources and then we will open it up if anybody has questions. So let me, let me go here. Um, I want to tell you about some of the resources that are out there that might be good tools that you could use um, when you're engaged in the outcome process. So the first one is, you can see that it has the three outcome areas and what's included. So it's a very nice tool to use as a reminder. Um, it's a nice um, tool that you actually could even um, take notes or highlight particular skill level of your children and those different things. We have a um, couple other things. We have um, the questions for parents. So we have, we have that document. So that can kind of frame your mind as to what the three outcomes areas have. We also did put the link to the indicator seven. So we talk, been talking about child outcomes and I can't recall if we actually said what, what it what it was thinking more from the technical aspect, it's indicator seven. Nancy talked about all those indicators and this one happens to be labeled indicator seven. But we put a link to the DPI webpage that does have a lot of information um, for providers and also um, parents to be if they have very particular questions about the process. Now, Stephanie had um, alluded to these two documents which are absolutely fabulous documents. So the first one, is the snapshot, so the student snapshot. And this is a great tool um, that, you can be, that you can use during IEP meetings. This is a great tool that has a variety of questions and um, STEM starters for you to think about and write information down. You'll notice that in this particular tool, um, after each question, there's um, some print that's in blue. That aligns with what part of the IEP that you're actually um, talking and providing information for. One thing, um, this is also a great tool that if you do it for the IEP and if your child qualifies, you will have information here that you'll be able to share with child out for child outcomes process too. So it's a really, it's a really nice tool um, that is being utilized by a lot of people across the state. And then Stephanie also talked about this tool that she had done on her daughter. Um, it was the All About Me tool. So this is, again, just another way for families to kind of collect all their thoughts together. So when you are at that IEP meeting, um, you're able to, you know, not forget anything. Um, you know, sometimes um, when I go into a meeting um, I, or a parent-teacher conference about, about my child, and um, I've had a few that might not have gone as smooth as I would want them to do, or I knew that they were not going to be smooth. What I did is I just had a list of things that I wanted to make sure that I was able to get across because sometimes in the heat of the moment, I just wasn't able to really think about that. So these are two nice tools just for collecting your ideas when you're engaged in the IEP process, which also the information from the IEP process is going to be information that can be used to help um, gain information for child outcomes. We have WISPY here. Um, we will also put the phone number for the, the 
state number, but WISPI is a fabulous organization that can provide support to you um, to help you go through that whole entire process. Um, anything with your child, they have the, fa um, the family engagement coordinators and the link to here shows, this is a really great site for parents. It has everything that you need. It has stuff not only about child outcomes, it's got stuff about IEPs and you know educational materials, agencies, your rights, all kinds of things. So this is another great place to to go. And then finally, we actually put some information um, the organization, the organization that Bonnie is representative of. We um, put some information about Wisconsin FACETS so that you'd have two parent organizations to go to if you had additional questions. So those are the resources that um, you can use and utilize during the child outcome process. We wanted to just open it up to questions because um, we really thank you for spending some time with us today. Uh, you know, I know everybody has a busy schedule and it was nice just for you to learn a little bit about the child outcome process so you can be more engaged. engaged. We can take a few minutes now if anybody has any questions. Um, you can type them in the the question box. Bonnie, were there any questions along the way? Um, we have a couple. The first one is, um, what happens if you believe your child's functional level is different than that assessment shows? Um, what kind of recourse do you have to address that? Okay, so if if your if an assessment tool is being done, and as as people are talking about um, where your child might be functioning in a, a different areas, um, you absolutely can bring up examples of how maybe some skills in that particular assessment did not, um, maybe wasn't as representative, and maybe maybe you may see those skills in a different setting. And that's the big thing about child outcomes. We we want to look across different situations and settings because sometimes kiddos do things at home that they don't display in a in a preschool setting, and vice versa. So you can actually um, those are those are discussions that you can have. The other thing too is the assessment tool is used to, to help us to engage in comparison against age expected um, levels um, that for children. But the other thing too is I talked about that decision tree and that decision tree is much more functional and it asks you very particular questions about different areas um, where your child is showing skills that are at age expected, where they might be showing some skills that are immediate foundational. And really as you use the information that the parent provided, that the service provider provided and the tool by going down those um, those questions from that decision tree, um, you will you will come to do uh, come to an answer um, to a, a rating. Okay, and the other one I have is when do you believe the time is appropriate during these processes to involve uh, information that's medical in nature and how do you get medical personnel involved in the assessments? Okay, so when we're talking about the assessments for child outcomes, um, absolutely, let's first talk about IEPs. If we're talking about the IEP process and there's significant medical concerns, absolutely, um, I am sure that that school district will be um, asking you questions about that. They may even actually suggest that a that um, someone from the, um, nursing services be on that team, but thinking about private medical people that you may wanna get involved. In the IEP process, you are welcome to bring anyone that you would like to the IEP meeting as, as support so that could happen there in this particular process that's why we um we when if your child has medical needs that is where we get the information of how they're currently displaying certain skills so it might be think about when we talked about um the area of independence where kiddos are um trying to show some of those motor type skills. And let's say maybe medically your child has some difficulty um, with motor. When we're gathering all that information, we're not stuck as much on particular scores. We're thinking about what your child does in that particular outcome area from a very functional perspective. So things that, that your child does around the home, things that your child um, does in, in natural situations. And that's where we pick up that information. And if your child has significant medical issues, that information will also be embedded in that. It might be that your child has different difficulty, uh, maybe your child uses a walker. Um, so that would actually, as we're doing the interview and we're collecting data, that would be very relevant um, data that we would collect and we would discuss. 
Okay, um, those are the two questions that I had right now. I just would like to add, um, as uh, Michelle had talked about, Wisconsin Facets, um, our Family Assistance Center for Education, Training and Support, is one of those mandated agencies from the Department of Education Office of Special Education Services that provides services to individuals with disabilities and those that um, support them. And we have a couple of publications to add to the list that um, the lady today have shared with you two in particular that you may be interested in. One specifically is the IEP checklist and we just finished the second one part of that and we have an IEP checklist for transition purposes also and those might be able to add to some of the information um, that Michelle was sharing with you just a little while ago and feel free to contact me or to our agency directly and we can provide some of those other uh, service information types of brochures to you as well. So Michelle and Stephanie and Nancy, um, do you have any closing comments you'd like to share? Well, I see one thing on the screen that I need to share. I'm going to send you a revise. I don't know why um, it may have been spacing why Stephanie, <laughs> your email is in a weird spot. Um, and then we'll send you a revised PowerPoint. But we, we just want to thank everybody. And our contact information is here. So as, as you're going through the process, if you need any support, you're more than welcome to reach out to us with any questions or you're absolutely really a, a good place to start with is your WISPY Family Engagement Coordinator. Stephanie or Nancy, do you have anything, final thoughts? I'm good. I don't need that much. So we want to thank everybody for coming. Um, again, you know, if you weren't able to think of questions right now, but if you end up going through the process and you come across some very specific questions, please reach out to us and then also think of your family engagement specialist. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> Thank you, Thank you, Nancy and Stephanie and Michelle for your presentation today. I know that I learned a lot and I'm sure that those in, that participated did as well. This will conclude our webinar for today. We'd like to thank you all for joining us. Please be reminded that Wisconsin Facets has over 100 scheduled trainings and webinars for the year 2022. And please feel free to check out our website calendar and register for any of the upcoming trainings that may be of interest to you. Also, please watch for the short evaluation that will be coming your way after today's live presentation. Again, thank you to our presenters and thank you everybody for joining us today. Have a good day, stay safe and be well. Bye everybody.